final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12703 in the name of Neil Finlay on encouraging good employment practices in Wales. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd invite those members who wish to take part in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Um, can I remind members that for the purposes of the standing order rule on sub judice, no mention should be made of any live cases during this debate. I now call on Neil Finlay to open the debate. Mr Finlay, seven minutes, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. Um, this member's debate is linked to a number of issues around public procurement and the use of uh, procurement to advance fairer employment practices. Uh, on this matter, the uh, Labour-led Welsh Assembly has often uh, led the way across the UK, whether it be tackling abuses of agency uh, working, bogus self-employment or blacklisting. Uh, public procurement in Wales has been a vehicle for improving the rights of people at work and uh, building mutually respectful partnerships between employers and employees. The Welsh Government has sought to extend good practice uh, wherever it is found, like the Memorandum of Understanding on direct employment that we saw at the Olympics, the Hinkley Point Agreement and the industry-wide agreements like the JIB. These are cited in Welsh policy advice notes as exemplars of good practice and procuring bodies are strongly encouraged to follow suit. At the pre-contract stage, employers have to set out how transparency and employment practices will be ensured throughout any contract, and this is reported on for the duration of that contract. Uh, contracting authorities are expected to monitor and expected to audit the employment practices adopted throughout the supply chain with collective agreements respected. Dodgy practices such as the exploitation of agency workers and the use of uh, bogus self-employment and umbrella companies are being proactively uh, tackled and addressed. In a previous members' debate, I, I went through the history of blacklisting and the impact on construction workers and their families. Um, some of the victims are at present in the middle of legal proceeding, uh, proceedings. Therefore, as the presiding officer says, these cases are sub judice. So I don't intend rehearsing all of that again. But what I do want to address is what has happened since that members' debate and what actions we need to take here in Scotland whilst learning from elsewhere. The Welsh Assembly was the first uh, legislature in the UK to act on blacklisting 111 Welsh workers names were found on the Consultant Association database. And when this came to light, the Welsh Finance Minister, uh, Secretary Jane Hutt moved to ensure that the Assembly took proactive steps to prevent any further blacklisting taking place, and in doing so sent a very clear message to those companies involved that they would not secure publicly funded contracts unless they put their house in order. And of course, the Scottish Government followed the Welsh lead with its November 2013 procurement advice note. This, yeah. Keith Brown. Can I thank uh, Neil Finlay for taking intervention, but would he acknowledge what's been said by Jane Hutt, that the Welsh Government only started looking at this in June 2013, a month after the Scottish Government shared its draft of blacklisting guidance with the Scottish trade unions, and also what UCAT has said, that the Scottish Government published Scottish procurement policy note goes beyond the general advice given by the Welsh Government. I don't think this is a competition, Finally. Mr Brown, and I, and I think I will raise some of these issues as I go on because there are uh, uh, problems still across the UK on a whole range of issues here. Um, and that was welcome. Uh, I do welcome the publication from the Scottish Government, but uh, at the same time as we passed the Public Procurement Bill, Parliament was advised that the accompaniment, uh, accompanying guidance would be backed by secondary legislation. This was, this was, it was said, to make it more flexible than primary legislation and could be amended to meet changing circumstances if that were deemed necessary. And whilst I disagreed with that approach and pushed my amendment for legislation, I accepted that the then Cabinet Secretary, now the First Minister, acted in good faith. But it's now clear that the Scottish Procurement Policy Note has not been adhered to and that many public authorities perhaps out of fear of legal reprisals from those companies they exclude they, or they may exclude uh, from competing for public works, are still awarding contracts to companies who were complicit in blacklisting. And that 
and that the Scottish policy note as it currently stands clearly is not working because since its introduction we've seen the Common Service, NHS Common Services Agency award a £660 million contract to a consortium of contractors including Balfour Beatty, Keir and Langer Rourke. Mr Finlay, I'd be grateful if you didn't mention our uh, names and confine, yourselves to, confine yourself to allegations rather than assertions of fact, please, in Presiding terms of the subjudice element. Presiding officer, none of what I've said relates to any uh, issues in court. This is publicly available contract information from the Scottish Government and from SPICE, so I think you may be conflating two issues, if, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, we have witnessed the Scottish Prison Service award a £2.5 million project to Carillion. Network Rail have awarded a £245 million contract to Castain. Transport Scotland award Balfour Beatty a £10 million contract. Scotland XL and Lerwick Harbour have given contracts to Keir. Bam, Nuttall, Skanska, Castain, all winning bids for public works. We have seen Moray Council, East Ayrshire Council, Fife and North Lanarkshire, East Ayrshire and Arran NHS, Scottish Hydro, just a second, Scottish Hydro, Robert Gordon University and others all awarded contracts to companies who have been involved in the blacklisting conspiracy. Certainly, Mr McKenzie. I appreciate that uh, um, Mr Finlay uh, um, may have suspicions that these McKenzie. companies are involved in that kind of activity, but in these matters, mere suspicions aren't good enough. Can he assure the Chamber that he's got exact knowledge that each and every one of the companies that he's mentioned have been legally convicted of the offences that he... Uh, that he Dear, um, no one has been legally convicted because the cases are on at the moment, but the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster investigated this and the companies were brought before them to give evidence, Mr Mackenzie. So I would suggest you maybe look at the two reports that have been provided by the Scottish Affairs Committee and look at some of the legal proceedings that are ongoing. But if you want to defend companies who have been involved in a human rights abuse, then you just carry on, Mr Mackenzie. And not a single company has self-cleansed. Not one has owned up. Not one has apologised and not one penny of compensation been paid. But public, the public procurement note advises that no company who has been involved in blacklisting should get a contract unless they have taken remedial action. But no remedial action has been taken, and still the contracts are given. A blacklisted worker who I spoke to this week uh, expressed his disgust that this should be happening despite all of what we know and all of we know, what we know of what went on. And I want to ask the Scottish Government whether, when the subordinate legislation and full guidance is introduced later this year, will that stop companies who have been involved in this, like those I've listed, from getting a public contract until they have taken that remedial action by accepting their guilt, apologising and providing justice and satisfactory compensation to their victims. Uh, the Scottish Government said it would wait on the publication of the Scottish Affairs Committee report before deciding what to do. Well, that committee has reported now twice, and with the election of a Tory government, there is, it is highly unlikely there will be any UK inquiry. Scottish workers were blacklisted in disproportionately high numbers, more than anywhere else in the UK. So I'm today calling on the Scottish Government to recognise this and initiate, initiate a Scottish inquiry into this scandal. Just a moment. And only through such an inquiry will we find out, find out why so many Scots had their lives ruined by this illegal practice. Mr Brown. Mr Brown. Given that, I uh, can thank uh, Mr Finlay for taking the invention, uh, intervention and acknowledge that we probably both very much regret the election of a Tory government, but given that, does he now regret that his party argued so strongly against the devolution of employment law, which would have allowed us to take action on these things much more effectively? You don't need any further powers to hold an inquiry in Scotland on this issue. Now, and Mr Brown, I am more than willing to take another intervention if you want to tell us that you will have an inquiry. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. 
Mr. I will I'll answer that question when I speak, but do you want to answer the point? Do you regret now arguing that the employment no. law should stay? Mr Finlay, you must draw to a close, please. Mr Finlay. No commitment. Mr Finlay, you must draw to a close, please, as you're over President nine minutes. Finally, President Officer, the, the Welsh Assembly has led the way on a number of positive developments using legislation where it can, but also its influence and spending power to address workforce matters and labour market abuse. It is now for the Scottish Government to use its power and its influence to make its guidance more robust. The current policy note, current policy note is not working and the Scottish Government must ensure that the subordinate legislation that is to come prevents the award of yet more contracts to the guilty and leads to the self-cleansing of the construction industry that I think we all want to see and crucially that it delivers long-awaited justice to the brickies and joiners, the sparks, plumbers, engineers and others who are looking for this Parliament to deliver for them. Many thanks. And before I call Joanne Lamont, I would again remind members we should avoid discussion of the ongoing litigation mentioning companies involved on any appropriate or inappropriate levels of compensation. So, can we please confine your remarks within those parameters, please? Joanne Lamont, four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I do welcome the opportunity to support this debate, congratulate Neil Finlay on bringing this debate and pursuing it in the way that he has done. I recognise the work of the unions in this regard and, indeed, as has already been referenced, the important work of the Scottish Select Committee, and I do hope that whatever the make-up of that committee is in the House of Commons, they continue to pursue with the same energy these very, very important issues for workers in Scotland and across, across the whole of the United Kingdom. This is a persistence that goes back a long time. I remember Maria Fife many, many years ago pursuing this whole question of blacklisting, the list being provided to companies so that we know the folk that they weren't take, to take on. And unions over many years highlighting just what some companies were willing to do um, um, in order to exclude people who they, they regarded as a problem. And I think it is appalling that blacklisting was used to deal with those who were doing that most decent of things, keeping people safe at work. And we know that the record of health and safety in the construction industry is still a scandal, and we know that it's a greater problem in Scotland than elsewhere. The very idea that when somebody raises a question about safety, your instinct is not to make your workplace safe, but to get rid of the person who's raising those questions almost um, is beyond belief. And this Parliament, over many years, has, for example, pursued the scandal of asbestos and the implications that had for people's health. And we know that this country has been scarred by silence over these issues. So I'm sure everybody across the Chamber understands how important exposing the whole question of blacklisting has been. Because we must fear that if you have a culture where you lose your job if you open your mouth, then people keep quiet. And in keeping quiet, people are put at risk, not just in that workplace, but potentially in um, the work that they're doing elsewhere. So I'm sure there's nobody in here wants to defend blacklisting. The only question is, how do we now make sure that we underline how absolutely unacceptable it is? And dancing on the head of a pin in the way that Mr McKenzie appears to have been doing, I don't think adds to the, um, assisting in that regard. And I do think it's important that there is an inquiry, simply as a, an act of justice for those who, were, who suffered in the way that they did, and for people to confront just how much it meant to people, what those consequences were. This wasn't just a bit of an employer not being very kind to the workforce. It was systematic, it was unacceptable, and people lived with the consequences for a long time. So I do think we could have an inquiry. I think it would be good in terms of creating standards uh, in the workplace and giving voice to those who suffered. So we do want companies to own up, to clean up, and pay up. It isn't difficult. And I'm sure there are many organisations, many companies who themselves did not involve themselves in that practice must agree to because they are also tarnished and damaged by that activity. But we also think of the important opportunity, and I do urge the, the government and the Cabinet Secretary in particular to recognise the importance of looking at how power can now be used, both to challenge those who did use the practice and to ensure that it never happens again. Recognise, I do recognise the steps the Scottish Government has already taken, but I would just simply say be confident enough to look to where there are other measures being taken to see if we can learn from them. I'm not asking you to say any other group of 
um, politicians better than you are, but simply to draw on that practice to see if we can strengthen our protections in this country. Because we do have the power of the public purse. We should be using the power of the public purse to drive up standards. And those who are not willing to drive those standards and commit to those standards should not benefit from that public purse. It's a truth in general around questions of wages and so on as well, but particularly in this regard. And I also say to the Cabinet Secretary, the privilege of power that you have in opposition, we can raise questions, we can pursue alongside the unions these scandals, we can stand with those who have um, suffered in that way, but you have the privilege of power and all I ask is that you exercise it to stop where you can these unacceptable practices and press for the kind of change that right across the chamber we are agreed on. We are not in dispute with you about whether this is a bad thing or not, we just simply urge you to look again at what else you can do in your position to make sure that those who, who acted in that way are exposed for what they've done, that they are forced to own up, clean up and pay up. And I think our workforce across Scotland, and particularly in the construction industry, will be a great deal of better for it. Many thanks. I now call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate, having run a construction business for over 30 years, and I'll say at the outset that I'm sympathetic to Mr Finlay's concerns regarding blacklisting, the use of umbrella companies and payment of the living wage. And some of the companies that he named earlier on may indeed be guilty as charged, but some of them may not. And I can never agree to Mr Finlay being the judge, jury and the executioner in this matter or indeed in any other matter. No, I don't have time, Mr Finlay. <laughs> All right then. Mr Finlay, and Mr. we will not be naming any companies Absolutely. from now on. Not at all. Or you'll be sitting down, Mr Finlay. Uh, Mr McKenzie, this is not me, judge, jury and executioner. All of this is on the public record by individuals who have been associated with these organisations. All I would ask you is to research it and look at it. Not me. Mr McKenzie. I think if Mr Finlay had listened properly, presiding officer, to the point I was making, um, then he wouldn't have uh, intervened to say what he, what he did say. I would say, and just put it on the record also, that I'm not yet an accredited living wage employer although I do pay at least the living wage, and in many years of business, always paid above the industry recommended rates. But I did so not so that I could put a plaque on the wall. The reward I received and continue to receive was the pleasure and the privilege of working with a team of people who were and are committed, conscientious and capable. And for those people whose only concern is profit, those businesses whose only concern is profit, I would also say that this investment in people has paid for itself many times over, over the years. The umbrella company was dreamt up, no doubt, by the same tax lawyers who advised the UK government on taxation policy from time to time and then go back and advise clients how to circumvent it. And it must be borne in mind, though, that the umbrella company is not illegal and is one response of an industry that deals with a difficult problem of an intermittent and fluctuating workload and a complex and, at times, incomprehensible tax and employment regime. The victims, as usual, of blacklisting and umbrella companies are the workers. And to that extent, as I've already said, I very much sympathise with at least part of Neil Finlay's motion. Unfortunately, though, Mr Finlay lives in the black and white world of oversimplification. What he fails to recognise is that the Scottish Government has to abide by both UK and EU legislation without any real say over either. And the legislation is complex and overlapping and in some cases obscure. 
And if the Scottish Government fails to abide by this, then any legislation it produces or any actions it takes in awarding contracts will most surely be challenged in the courts. Legal actions, certainly. Joanne Lamont. Member could tell us what is oversimplified about somebody losing their job and not being told that they have lost their job? And what is so complex that an inquiry could not establish exactly what was done so that we can be clear who was responsible and who was not responsible? We could separate those companies with an honourable record from those who have not. Mackenzie. I am sure Joanne Lamont will, will, will know that uh, employment legislation is a reserved matter and it is reserved to the UK Government. Um, if those powers were reserved to this Parliament and to this Government, no doubt we could simplify them. But legal actions can be costly, and often the losers in such actions are the public, in terms of the loss of best value, in terms of inordinate delays in providing necessary infrastructure. And, and the losers are often construction firms, in terms of uncertainty. And the victims are often workers in terms of the loss of meaningful and secure work. And this is the reality in the increasingly litigious world we live in. The Scottish Government has issued guidance on blacklisting and umbrella companies. In fact, it has gone further in some respects than the Welsh Government. And it has encouraged the payment of the living wage. It is doing what it can do with the powers currently available. And there is, of course, a simple solution. And that, as I have said, you might wish to draw to a close, are the full please. powers of, uh, will do, President Officer, and that is for the full powers of our employment law and taxation to be devolved to this Parliament. We have been promised a powerhouse Parliament, not the palliative care Parliament we have, which is unable to do anything other than mitigate a little bit of the pain inflict us on, inflicted on us by the UK government. So if Mr Finlay really cares about this issue, he I should Mr. support McKenzie, our I'm afraid you're going to have to close now for at six minutes. Pow those powers to be devolved to this Parliament. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now call on Jackie Bailey to be followed by Alex Rowley. Um, Presiding officer, it is customary to be very reasonable in members' debates. Um, I, I think we have been provoked unduly by Mr Mackenzie into not being quite so reasonable this evening. But let me, let me try, because I want to start by congratulating Neil Finlay on securing the time for this debate and for the passion in his speech this evening. But, you know, can I say to Mr Mackenzie, it really is simple. This parliament has powers. It has powers it can use to have an inquiry. It is a dereliction of its duty to the people that I believe the Cabinet Secretary actually does care about not to use those powers. Indeed. Brown. Uh, can I uh, refer to the statement that Jackie Bailey just made and also to what uh, Joanne Lamont said in terms of the privilege of power? When did the Labour Party, in its eight years in government here or in the 13 years in government south of the border, use that privilege of power to hold an inquiry? Can, can, can I make the simple suggestion to you that the scandal first came to light in 2009, so certainly in this Parliament we weren't in a position to do that, you were, but can I say to you it's not about who does it, we will support you in taking such an action forward, because bad employment practices shouldn't be tolerated, you know, irrespective of who has the power and which government is doing the inquiry. You say, and your government says, inequality is bad for the economy. Unfairness is bad for the economy. Well, guess what? I agree, but there is nothing more unequal or unfair than what we've witnessed in terms of bad employment practices. Now, I know, you know, my colleagues know well, that I often quote Richard Leonard from the GMB. And this debate is no exception because he was absolutely right when he said that the construction industry blacklisting scandal is not a tale of a few bad apples, but an entirely rotten system which operated in a supposedly advanced democratic state. And for much too long, the practice of blacklisting has flourished. But if you heard the denials at the time, you saw the innocent faces of those businesses engaged in the practice, you could be forgiven for thinking that somehow you had imagined it all. But the harsh reality is that, no, I'm not going to take any interventions from Mr Mackenzie. I think I've heard quite enough from you this evening. But the harsh reality is that blacklisting is very real 
and it's been used as a secret tool to keep out workers they simply didn't like. Now, when the, sc the scandal first came to light, it was indeed in 2009, but it was revealed that blacklisting wasn't something that was simply isolated or rare. For 16 years, people compiled a secret database of thousands of construction workers. The files contained extremely detailed and personal information, names, addresses, national insurance numbers, even comments made by managers. More than 500 workers in Scotland affected, over 3,000 workers across the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, let me be very clear in condemning this shameful practice because blacklisting is nothing short of a gross abuse of human rights. Many of the workers affected, as Joanne Lamont has pointed out, were union members who had raised health and safety concerns. Their files included phrases such as, will cause trouble, strong trade union, or ex-shop steward, definite problems. And the effect on the careers and their lives and the lives of their families was absolutely devastating. So we must ensure that blacklisting is outlawed. We should learn from our neighbours. Wales has been held up as an example, committed to an ethical, responsible procurement policy which facilitates better employment practices. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree that we should ensure that procurement is used to achieve better employment practices in Scotland too because we have witnessed the increasing casualisation of the workforce. We've seen zero hours contracts, changes to terms and conditions, reduction in hours so that many workers are now underemployed. Now, whilst I believe we could have done more in the procurement bill, let me echo Joanne Lamont's comments. Let's agree that blacklisting is bad. I don't think anybody in this chamber thinks otherwise. But the challenge to government is what more you can do to protect the very workers I believe we have a common interest in protecting. I welcome the Scottish Government procurement policy note. Of course I do. Anything that helps is to be welcomed. But we do need to remember that these are simply guidelines for public authorities. They're not legally binding. The government ambition was to bring in secondary legislation. That's an ambition that hasn't yet been met. It's something we would like to see happen, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary would agree that it's something he wants to see happen too. So let's work together to make that happen. Let's put the secondary legislation in place because we share a common agenda to protect workers in Scotland engaged in public contracts, and indeed more widely than that. But let me also say to the Cabinet Secretary, having an inquiry here would also help to shed light on some of those bad practices to ensure that they don't happen again. I hope he can find it in himself to actually take forward the ambition of this parliament across the entirety of the chamber to do exactly that. Because, you know, after all, close, the services that are delivered, presiding officer, and I'll finish on this point, they are public services. We should expect the same ethos, consideration and approach to their delivery, irrespective of whether it's in the public or private sector. The Cabinet Secretary has an opportunity to do something good. I hope he seizes it. Thank you. Now call on Alec Rowley to be followed by Hugh Henry. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I would also um, applaud Neil Finlay for securing this debate today. And I would call, stand to, to call for support um, for his call that the Scottish Government once and for all hold an inquiry into blacklisting and that uh, they review the current guidelines and consider whether they are fit for purpose. Um, the Minister, in some sense, has, has re responded to this, and I was disappointed when, when he, he decided to blame someone else before we actually hear his answer. But in this instance, you can't blame a previous government in here um, for not holding an inquiry, given that it was not known at that time exactly to the extent that blacklisting um, is, 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 is being carried out. Um, it was in 2009 that the names of 3,300 people were discovered on a blacklist in the offices of a consultancy agency, including over 500 workers from Scotland. That's why this government and this parliament would be right to hold an inquiry, and it's why we must, I would suggest, hold an inquiry. It strikes me that the advances that have been made in health and safety in my lifetime 
the advances that have been made in terms and conditions for workers and workers' rights in my lifetime did not happen by accident. They happen because men and women, shop stewards, trade union members up and down this country fought for better terms and conditions, fought for health and safety. And so many of them who are no longer with us uh, would be turning in their graves to see that their fellow trade unionists be treated in this way, in an impolum way. Yeah, OK. Mackenzie. Uh, carefully to what... Uh uh, Mr. Riley said, and I wonder if he agrees with me uh, or agrees with the STUC that trade union and employment law should be devolved to this parliament, particularly in the light of the anti-trade union proposals in last week's Queen's speech. Riley. The minister, the minister seems to want to divert it by, by blaming Labour, and Mr Mackenzie seems to want to divert us from the question by trying to look at powers that, that we don't have. But we do have the power to hold inquiry. That's the whole point. We have the powers here to hold inquiry. Therefore, we don't and should not be blaming anybody else for not doing so. But if I can come back to, to trade unionists, men and women that were absolutely dedicated to fighting not for themselves, but for the rights of workers and for health and safety, so that when workers went out in the morning, their families knew they were going to come back at night. The advances that they made. And I think I think you know, what sums up for me was Michael Mutcher on the 23rd of January 2013, where he described blacklisting as arguably the worst human rights abuse against workers in the UK since the war. It is worse than imprisonment in that it usually is imposed on the victim without being given the opportunity to defend themselves, and it lasts for an indefinite period, often decades. The impact that that's had on workers, the impact that it's had on their families. We know that there is at least 500 victims in Scotland from blacklisting, and we need to do something about that. And I would appeal to the Minister to look at the call that's been made by Neil Finlay and once and for all hold an inquiry into blacklisting and review the current guidelines, considering whether they are indeed fit for purpose. Thank you very much. I now call on Hugh Henry, and after which move the closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I want to congratulate Neil Finlay, not just for his powerful and emotional speech, but also for a very forensic contribution, where he set out the facts and figures of this scandal which has, has come to light in our country. You know, and it, in a way, it's quite opposite that we're having this debate in the week where there is controversy about whether or not the Scottish national football team should play Qatar in a friendly match because many people have become concerned that it's inappropriate for Scotland to play Qatar against the backdrop of the thousands of deaths of immigrant workers in that country. Uh, who are building Steria in preparation for the World Cup. And when we look at the conditions that these workers operate in, and when we look at the appalling death rate, and when we consider what happened in the, in the, in the terrible factory uh, collapse in Bangladesh, when we look at the scandal of Bhopal, then there is a, a theme, a common thread running through all that. And that's where companies, often multinational companies, are able to exploit workers who are not able to organize in trade unions and who are not able to defend themselves, that these companies will seek to exploit those poor workers right up to the point of death in order to maximise their profits. Now, Alec Rowley paid tribute to the generations of men and women who fought in factories and workplaces in this country to make sure that ordinary working people in Scotland and elsewhere in the United Kingdom were able to go to work with a degree 
of certainty and assurance about their working conditions and their safety. Now, we know, tragically, from the uh, events in Mary Hill some years ago, that it doesn't always guarantee 100 per cent. But when we look at our health and safety record in this country and we contrast it to the examples that I mentioned, then you can see the advantage of brave men and women standing up and defending their friends and their colleagues in their workplaces and pressing for conditions that benefit the workers. And it's because of that track record of determination of many shop stewards and trade unionists that these multinational companies, and it wasn't local companies, that the multinational companies have sought to blacklist those who have been effective in standing up for the rights of ordinary working people. And as other speakers have indicated, there is a scandal that has blighted their lives, many not able to work again, some only able to work at jobs that are less well paid than those that they previously had. And it has only recently come to light just what these companies have been doing. And this shouldn't be a debate about whether you know, someone else was right or wrong or someone should have taken action earlier, nor should it be a debate about what more powers do we need to have. Let's have that debate by all means. But let's also, just for the moment, look at what we can do here and now to make a difference. Even incrementally, no, no thanks, I'm about to finish, but even incrementally doing something that will improve the lives. Now, we've heard the calls for an inquiry, something that we could do, because an inquiry would actually help to guide future investment decisions of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust. Because if they then found practices that were unacceptable, I would hope that that would then make them think twice about where the investment goes. But equally, let's look at the procurement note. Because it would be wrong to pass the buck of the responsibility to local councillors without giving them assurances and guarantees about the investment decisions that they are making. So they need that backup and support from the Scottish Government so that they know that the law and the guidelines will protect them when they do take action against these companies who are refusing to face up to their responsibilities. So yes, this is a scandal. Yes, these companies are still making massive profits. Yes, their shareholders are still benefiting. Yes, their senior management are being, uh, are being awarded payments that are absolutely grotesque in comparison to the damage that they have caused. And yes, it surely should be right that we at least show some good faith to those brave men and women who've tried to do something to make life tolerable for those that they work with. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move the closing speech from the Minister, Mr Brown. Hey. And from the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, please. Thank you, Deputy President, sir. Uh, and I think this is an extremely important issue to be debated, and for that reason, would uh, congratulate Neil Finlay on securing the debate. Uh, I do think, though, it's essential that I strongly refute the suggestion that the Welsh Government has taken action that this Government has not taken, uh, that it's gone quicker or further than we have. I think, first of all, to agree with some of the points that have just been made, in fact, one of the words which Hugh Henry used is one which I noted, the, the word blighted. I think the, the simple fact is, for many people uh, there, Promotion opportunities, their employment opportunities uh, were blighted, and of course the welfare of their families were blighted as a result. And often, as has been said, without them even knowing about that, and I think that is an absolutely scandalous way to behave. It's an abhorrent uh, way for employers to behave. Um, during uh, my 19 years as a trade unionist, we discussed this kind of thing quite regularly. It wasn't a recent thing. It was usually in terms of whether somebody had been passed over promotion because of their trade union activities, or perhaps they were the first to go into a list uh, of redundancies. It was usually that suspicion that was there. And we've had different um, versions of this. Some people have said it's a recent thing, and we've not known since we've only known since 2009. Others have said, I think Joanne Lamont said it had been going on for years. Well, uh, Maria Fife, who was mentioned, actually tried to introduce a bill in 1988 
called the Access to Information Bill blacklists. She spoke about her constituent who she believed was blacklisted by the, the Economic League. So this was known about, has been known about uh, for a long time. Yes, I will. Finley. Uh, he's, uh, he's absolutely right, and, and, and we agree on that point. Yeah. The issue is that the raid uh, got the full information, or not the full information, but got information back on individuals who can be identified and companies who were blacklisted. That is the big difference, that the raid made all the difference with the evidence that we now have. I accept uh, Neil Finley's point up to a point. Of course, had that bill been preceded with subsequently, though, access to information bill, this information could have been gained far earlier, long before 2009. Had this bill... Now, I appreciate it was a bill that was put forward at a time when a Conservative government were in office. I understand that point and presumably didn't succeed for that reason. It could have been brought in subsequently and the information which was unveiled in 2009 could have happened much earlier. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, uh, yes, I will, yeah. Definitely. So the, the, the argument that he's making, the logic that, he, that he's uh, making there in re reference to that bill, would lead me to say, therefore, you have the opportunity to introduce an inquiry, so let's not wait and blame someone else. Yep. You can do it like that government could have done it then. They chose not to. Are you going to choose not to also? I think there's two points to respond to that. I was going to come on to the inquiry subsequently, but I think there's two points. The fundamental difference, of course, and now I know those benches don't agree with us. They think it's somehow an irrelevance of the fact that we have no control over employment law. I think it's a very big issue. It also impinges on the worthiness of an inquiry as well. I'll come back to an inquiry in a minute or two. Now, the guidance that we published in 2013, first shared in draft with the Scottish Trade Unions and the STUC in May 2013, is clear. Firms engaging in blacklisting have committed grave misconduct and should be excluded from public procurement unless they can demonstrate appropriate remedial action. The guidance is a strong deterrent to uh, those who might blacklist. It's also having a it would also have a positive effect on contractor behaviour, encouraging contractors to take steps to put things right. Uh, no, I'm trying to make some progress. I don't have much time left. Uh, Neil Furnish's concerns seem to be that some companies alleged to have blacklisted have won contracts since the guidance was published. Uh, two points I think are important here. Firstly, as I've said already, employment law is still reserved. We've taken the firmest action in the UK to use public procurement to prevent blacklisting. But until this employment law is strengthened, effectively enforced, and those are judgments made against offenders, it's extremely difficult in practice for purchasers to exclude companies for blacklisting. Secondly, and relevant to this motion, According, no, I won't. According to the Welsh Government's procurement website, Sell to Wales, 13 companies, 13 companies named by the Information Commissioner's Office as subscribers to the Consulting Association have won public contracts in Wales since November 2013. Seven of those contracts, no, seven of those contracts were awarded by the Welsh Government itself. Now, I know this is uncomfortable, but it happens to be a fact. Uh, and it didn't appear to make it into, of course, Neil Finlay's motion. Which, Mr Finlay, you know, please allow the Cabinet the... Secretary to make some progress and perhaps he'll take an intervention once it, he does. The Welsh Government, uh, you know, much was made of the Welsh Government have acted, the Labour-led Welsh Assembly has acted ahead of everyone else and gone much further. And then when it was pointed out that was untrue, even in the words of UCAT, well, it's not a competition. You can't have it both ways. Uh, presiding officer, I highlight the points that have been made about Wales, not to denigrate our colleagues in Wales, who are equally opposed to blacklisting, but to tackle the false premise of the motion put forward by Neil Finlay, that the Welsh Government is taking action that we are not. Without control over employment law, has there been an inquiry in Wales, presiding officer? No, there's not been an inquiry in Wales. So they don't have control over employment law. The Welsh Government faces the same difficulties that we do. And if only that had been acknowledged... Perhaps in the same kind of tone that Joanne Lamont made her contribution by acknowledging that we perhaps agree on the fundamentals here, but there are major problems in how we deal with it. In terms of broader employment practices, we also condemn the inappropriate use of umbrella companies, particularly where that has a detrimental effect on workers' terms and conditions. And we would congratulate the Welsh Government on following our lead in providing guidance, promoting positive employment practices and public contracts. But the Welsh guidance does not, as reported, ban the use of umbrella companies in public contracts. It provides details on the instances where discrepancies between pay and the rights of workers not directly employed by contractors may occur. The Scottish Government policy guidance on workforce matters and employment practices goes further, and it also addresses workforce matters, including living wage and zero hours contracts. I will, yes. Van Lamont. Just for clarification, can you explain why you can't have an inquiry, given that you have had quite inquiries on other very serious matters? We're not having any debate about who's done what, where, and who's better or not. 
Why can we not have an inquiry? Which, and why would it not be able to inform us in terms of what we might be able to do in the future? Cabinet Secretary. I don't think what you've just said is true. I think we are having a debate about who's done what. It's been littered with references to who's doing what. So don't, let's, let's not pretend this has been done in a completely non-partisan manner, because it's not. We certainly agree on things, and I do appreciate the way that Joanne Lamont's put her point forward. What I would say in relation to the inquiry, which Neil Finlay didn't take care to mention, was I've agreed to meet with Neil Finlay and other, and other representatives to discuss this issue. I want to hear from him, having looked into this myself, what could be achieved by an inquiry. I genuinely want to know what he thinks could be achieved, especially in the absence of power over employment law. I'm genuinely waiting to hear that. So I'll meet with Neil Finlay and I'll discuss those issues and we'll take it forward from there. All I can do is take an open mind to this, having done a fair bit of work myself to find out what we could possibly do. The of course, with this respect, is important. you can bring the weight of government to testing whether an inquiry would be worthwhile or not. Keith Brown. I think I've answered the point that was made there, President Officer. So there's, well, I'm happy to continue the dialogue if the dialogue is what's wanted. If it's not, if it's simply, as it always seems to be with Neil Finlay, let's see how we can have a go at the SNP. There's not much point in that dialogue. I've just said I'm willing to take an open approach and approach with an open mind the discussions. No, I won't. Uh, no, I won't. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take an open mind towards the discussions which you're about to have. M Mr Finlay, be quiet. Well, we'll see if, if, if what's actually proposed is a dialogue or, or, or a monologue, as is per usual with Mr Finlay. The Scottish Government policy guidance on workforce matters and employment practices, as I've said, goes further. It also addresses those workforce matters, including the living wage and zero-hours contracts. And where our guidance introduced, tra uh, introduces transparent tender evaluation criteria for relevant contracts, the Welsh Government doesn't do that. Now, I'm not saying that's having a go at them, but you can't say that the Welsh Government have gone further than the Scottish Government when the facts don't sustain that. In relation to the living wage, we fully support the living wage and we recognise the real difference it can make to the lives of the people of Scotland. We are funding the Poverty Alliance to promote the take-up of the living wage accreditation system in every sector across Scotland. In the last 12 months, we've seen the number of Scots-based living wage accredited employers increase significantly from just 30 to over 200. And this morning, the First Minister hosted a living wage summit with business leaders and representatives from sectors where the living wage is not widely paid. And the Scottish Government today has been confirmed uh, in its status as a living wage accredited employer. We have been paying all staff at least a living wage for some time now, and I am happy to say that we are amongst a number of officially accredited employers. We cannot make the living wage mandatory in public contracts. We do strongly encourage it. It was the Labour Party's position that you could do that and that the Scottish Government had voted against that, but of course that wasn't borne out by the Labour Party's own manifesto at the election we've just had. The Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014 allows us to do uh, the encouragement which I've talked about by providing statutory guidance on workforce matters and procurement, including the living wage. And promoting the living wage through public procurement, however, is a weak alternative to having the powers over employment law which we asked the Smith Commission to deliver, incidentally which the Labour Party argued most forcibly against us gaining those powers. So, presiding officer, I am grateful for the opportunity to place the Scottish Government's commitment to fair work on the record again. I am proud that we have shown the way and that others are now following our footsteps. There is, despite all this, agreement across the Chamber, I believe, or at least that part of the Chamber that is represented here tonight, on the importance of tackling these issues. I can't help reflecting, however, on how much easier it would be to tackle them head-on if we had control over employment law. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now close this meeting of Parliament.